Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Coronavirus in Context. What's the role of what we eat in terms of either getting COVID or protecting us when we do get COVID? What is the role of food and immunity? To help provide guidance and give us some insights, I've asked my good friend, Dr. Dean Ornish, the founder of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute in Sausalito, California. Dean, it's great to see you. Always good to see you, John. Dean, you and I have talked about several times these two studies that recently came out that talk about the role of dietary habits in COVID. And I wanna start off with the first one from BMJ Nutrition, Prevention and Health, where they followed 3000 frontline doctors and nurses across six countries. Can you tell us what they found? Sure, and I think it's a particularly compelling study. You know, with the Omicron variant, as, as you've talked about on, on your previous shows, even if you're triple vaccinated, uh, there's still a, a number of people who break through because it's so infectious. And so I think people are really looking for what else can I do besides you know, getting vaccinated, of course, wearing masks, social distancing, all the usual things that might also help me to, to stay well, or if I do get sick to get a more a milder version of it. And this was uh, one of two, I thought, particularly compelling studies that just came out a, a few weeks ago. And as you say, they looked at 3,000, almost 3,000 frontline healthcare workers who get exposed to COVID every day. And they found that those that were eating a, a healthy plant-based diet were 73% less likely to get moderate to severe COVID. Those following a pescatarian diet, a healthy plant-based diet with some fish, were 59% less likely. And equally amazing, those following a, a high animal protein, you know, high fat, Atkins, paleo, keto type diets, were 400% more likely to get moderate to severe COVID. So, you know, we already know that a healthy plant-based diet has so many beneficial effects beyond COVID, but I think this is just the latest example of things that we can do ourselves to help enhance our immunity. A similar study you mentioned in gut that followed 600,000 people in the US and London. And what did they find? Yeah, these were scientists at, uh, at Harvard School of Public Health, people like Dr. Walla, Walter Willett and at King's College in London. And they looked at almost 600,000 people and they found something similar that those eating a, a healthy plant-based diet were 41% less likely to develop moderate to severe COVID. Uh, and there are other studies that have looked at and found that when you get vaccinated, those who are smokers or who are overweight or who are hypertensive, they don't develop nearly as much of an immune response. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, seeing it from both perspectives. And also, as you know, people who are, have chronic diseases, who are overweight, who are hypertensive, if they do get hospitalized, are more likely to be hospitalized and more likely to die from COVID. You know, just being obese, for example, can raise your risk of mortality by 300%. It's part of, you know, an overall thing that I've written about for years that, um, you know, why is it that these simple, simple lifestyle changes can make such a powerful difference? And I think it's because they affect so many different parts of our underlying, uh, the, the biological mechanisms that affect our underlying health, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in immune function, as we've been talking about with the microbiome and telomeres and gene expression, angiogenesis and so on. And each of these mechanisms in turn are directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get and how much love and support we have. And I think this is just the latest version of that. I do wanna turn back to these two studies. A criticism has been, Dean, that those were done at a time when we didn't have the ability to do a lot of testing. So the presence of COVID was largely determined by symptomatology. Not completely, but that, that was a measure. Does that take away from what these studies seem to be showing? Well, not at all, <clears throat> because again, we're talking about moderate to severe COVID. Um, so you know, even if you're not able to test for it, as accurately as we can now, when, when people get to that degree of symptomatology, it's pretty clear what they have. Okay. So I don't think it really takes away. Now, you know, there's another point of view that maybe it's not such a bad thing if a lot of people get, you know, the Omicron because the symptoms seem to be less severe and maybe that's part of how we'll get to herd immunity and certainly you can make a case for that. What concerns me about that is the long COVID and then even the mm -hmm. more mild versions of the Omicron variant still don't necessarily reduce the long right. COVID, which can you know, cause brain fog and myocarditis and other things like that. 
let's break it down for folks because you and I are familiar with these terms. You've been an expert in this from the very beginning when it wasn't popular to talk about these things. People forget that, the role of stress, the role of diet. But people are, are going to say, mm, okay, well, what do you mean, Dr. Ornish, by plant-based diet? Break it down for them. What, what, <laughs> what, what does that mean? That doesn't just mean they're eating lettuce and kale. Help them understand what that means. A plant-based diet is the way that most people ate worldwide until they had the prosperity to be able to eat animal protein as often as we do and process foods and, and concentrated sweeteners and so on. So it's mainly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, uh, soy products, as close as possible to how they come in nature. And I think there's a growing consensus that this is really the, the optimal way for most people to eat. Not only is it low in the disease causing substances, but there are literally hundreds of thousands of protective substances in fruits and vegetables that, you know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genosine, lycopene, on and on and on that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, and anti-aging properties. Well, let, let's talk about the barriers. And, and you've heard all of these before. I've been in many meetings with you, but let's just go over them for our audience. So, you know, people will say, mm, you know, it's too expensive. The, the food spoils if I don't eat it soon. Or they'll say, as you know, I, I don't like that. I don't like the taste, right? <laughs> of yeah, yeah. plant-based Am I going to live longer? Right. Or is it just going to seem longer? Right, you know, exactly, like exactly. Like, you know, I need to, I'm a steak and potatoes kind of person. What's your yeah. response to them when they're saying food is really something that they view is designed to give them pleasure. And there's a role of food in that in community. But at the same time, we're trying to talk about food as medicine, the, the properties yeah. that it has to help our immune systems, particularly when we're talking about COVID. How do you reconcile that with patients? Yeah, well, it's an important question. First of all, this is a third world diet. This is the way people ate before they had the funding to eat animal protein as often as they do, or saturated fats or concentrated sweeteners or processed mm -hmm. foods. You know, this is a, the least expensive way to eat, uh, number one. In fact, I uh, one of people my colleagues- People push back I, on that, Dean. They'll, they'll say, you know what, the, the dollar meal, at a fast food restaurant is much cheaper and keep my kids fuller longer. Well, a colleague of mine and I trained the St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter in our program 20 years ago. Over 30,000 homeless people went through it. So, you know, they can buy, you can buy food at food co-ops. It's, it's actually less, you, know, you can obviously, you can spend more money if you want to eat truffles and, you know, really expensive things, but you can eat a very healthy plant-based diet for less than it costs you to, to get meat, especially now with inflation and the price of meat is soaring. Uh, number two, you can eat food that's delicious and nutritious. Now, in fairness, Dean, people are going to wonder, right? Okay, I'll switch to a plant-based diet. Let's assume folks can do that. Am I going to reduce my risk of heart disease? Am I not going to have a heart attack now? If I'm much older in life, am I going to reduce my chances of COVID? Will I not get COVID? Um, what do you say to them? They're willing to switch. What yeah, you will them? reduce your risk, but reducing risk or fear is another way to put it, is not a sustainable motivator. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, after someone's had a heart attack or a friend's got COVID or something, they'll do pretty much anything that their doctor tells them or their nurse tells them to do for maybe a month or two. And that's about it. What, yeah. what is sustainable? Because, you know, we all know we're going to die. The mortality rate is mm -hmm. still 100%. It's one per person. We don't think about mm -hmm. it most of the time because it's too scary. So when the denial breaks down after someone's had an event, then there's a motivational moment, but even then it doesn't last that long because the denial comes back. We don't want to think about the fact that we're mortal, so we don't. But what I found actually, what is sustainable is not fear of dying, but joy of living. That joy and pleasure and love and feeling good ultimately are much more sustainable. Well, Dr. Ornish, as always, I want to thank you for giving us a fresh perspective and a renewed perspective on how what we eat, our dietary habits, impacts our health. Thank you for having me. You know, our new paperback is Ornish.com. It's all in there. And I feel so passionate about doing this work because I've seen what a powerful difference it can make in people's lives. And to me, awareness is always the first step in healing. So thank you for helping to raise awareness today. I'm really grateful. And it's always great to see you. Absolutely. If you have questions for me or Dr. Ornish, feel free to drop us a line. You can email me at drjohn at webmd.net. Thanks for watching.